enjoy the fun. I'll attempt to be. I'll attempt to be interesting. Try to probably try to. fail. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. Thanks for coming on this crazy hot February. Is the AC running? Uh, I'm going to tell you guys a little bit today about um, what we've been learning and what we learned about the refugio oil spill uh, not quite a year ago. Um, but to give you the full context, I'll segue a little bit into the story with other oil spills to, to hopefully properly frame stuff for you. But like I said before, if you guys, if I'm not making sense, if you have a question, interrupt. It's, we're a nice small group here, so it's not a, not a huge deal to segue off. Uh, the first thing I'll say... So I'm up here talking, my name is Sean Anderson, I'm a professor from California State University Channel Islands. Um, and so I tend to sometimes be the one that the reporter people talk to or the whoever talk to, but it's real important for me to make sure that you know this is a huge group of folks working on this at my uh, university and our, our collaborators elsewhere. So just, just a small subset of these folks are listed up here. Um, they include everyone from uh, my son, who is, you know, in middle school to uh, students that work with us from um, various community colleges, Santa Barbara, Moore Park, all over the place. So we have a ton of uh, wonderful collaborators. And so uh, to start off, this is um, in the midst of the oil spill when we were sampling material coming back to this is our old lab now. We still have this lab, but we just moved into brand new facilities, brand new state of the art lab. But um, tons of folks working all kinds of crazy hours. No one was paid for this. this. You don't usually have the grant stuff lined up ahead of time knowing that an oil spill would happen. So um, a massive volunteer effort was incredibly key for us uh, to get this information and this understanding that we'll talk about. <laughs> so if I totally bore you and I make everybody go to sleep and snore, the, these are the conclusions of, our of my talk. So we'll get back to that at the, at the end. But um, we're going to talk about the Sandy Beach, which is really where this oil spill, where the story of this oil spill was, unlike um, many other oil spills. Um, we'll touch on the dysfunctional um, command structure that we have to manage these uh, issues. And um, just a little bit about uh, the, the notion of ecological impacts, which I think we typically think about and are, and are most worried about in these oil spills. But also there's, so, there, there's impacts to our human society and our economics and our goings on and all that kind of stuff that are important to make sure we understand as well. And I think this just really shows how well, um, not to toot my own horn, but I, I've been at many research universities um, before I came and helped start uh, Channel Islands. And I really honestly believe that what we're doing there um, is different than almost everywhere else. And we're really trying a new model of public education. We're really focused on what we call service learning, service of the community, and, uh, and a whole bunch of other things that really train students to graduate and go on to work immediately in, in industry and in government agencies solving these kind of problems. Um, that honestly is quite different from my, uh, my universities where I came from, but also uh, what my colleagues are doing in other places. So to start off, let's talk a little bit about um, the background uh, before we get to last May and, and the context of understanding what's been going on with oil spills around the world. The first thing to say is a, a very common misconception is the Deepwater Horizon, which happened in 2010, was the largest oil spill in U.S. history. That's not true. The largest oil spill in U.S. history is very close to us right here. It's about an hour, hour and 20 minute drive from us right here. You just go right up the grapevine and go down the grapevine. As soon as you get down right near Button Willow, uh, that's where the um, Kern County uh, Lakeview gusher happened a century ago. And that was crazy. So this is a picture from that time. So these were, these were back in the, this was back in the day before we had big, fancy uh, corkscrew oil drilling wells and guys really just sort of pulled up basically big chisels, big bits, in, either by human power or by animal power and, and let them go and these things, bang, hit the ground and it was very much so a manual process. Uh, the Bakersfield area, which was the first big, big, big oil boom in the US. Um, that area uh, was producing all kinds of, of oil and gas, uh, especially oil. And these guys uh, thought they found a great spot, they started digging, 
boom, got it, and it started going, and it went, and it went, and it blew oil in the air for about a year. They laid train tracks from Los Angeles, a spur from the LA line to go up there, and tourists used to go up daily to look at it. Depending on the way the wind was blowing, they would either open the windows on the train car so people could look out at this fountain of oil that went hundred, at, at, at sometimes hundreds of feet in the air. Other days when the winds were shifted, they'd have to keep those windows closed because the entirety of the side of the train would be covered in oil. So what we're seeing here are, is, is, is um, part of one of the series of lakes, the oil lakes that were created. These lakes, uh, some of them were 30 meters deep, so 100 feet deep of these massive oil lakes. We know almost nothing about the impact of this oil spill because we didn't have the modern tools and the training and the awareness that we have now, but clearly a massive ecological impact on that part of um, of the valley and, and a huge a huge story. So that is the largest oil spill in US history. Um, like I said, it, it went for um, a long time, it went for a year. And you see these guys here actually laying sandbags. They tried everything. They tried throwing, you know, big uh, gobs of stuff in to physically block the hole. Didn't work, didn't work, didn't work. You see those guys up there, they're, they're paddling on a lake of oil. Uh, eventually, it just stopped. Eventually, the pressure, we essentially purged all the oil out of that particular reservoir, and it just stopped on its own. A really cool museum, I would encourage all you guys, if you have time, is to go check out the Kern County Oil Museum, which is where all these images are from. Really cool museum. It's free. There's a lot of wonderful retired folks that, that sit around there and hardly get any visitors, so they love to answer your questions. It's a really neat uh, old museum with a lot of uh, interesting history about the Lakeview Gusher and other goings on in the um, oil and gas drilling in that part of our state. So to give you some context, there's a bunch of numbers here, I don't want to freak anybody out, but just so that we can talk gross percentages, the, the spill that we had, and so this is all relative to the Deepwater Horizon, because that seems to be the current benchmark that everybody's using these days when we talk about a big oil spill. So, so I have the date and then how many um, barrels. Uh, a barrel is 42 gallons, if you care about that, but probably, probably don't. Um, so, so on the right, in the lighter color there, I have all the relative percentages compared to the Deepwater Horizon. So the, Gavi, so the spill that we just had, the refugio uh, spill, that was um, you know, one one hundredth of a percent of, of what actually came out in Deepwater Horizon. Uh, Deepwater Horizon, um, as we know, that was in 2010. That was the largest marine oil spill in U.S. history. Um, and I, I have been working on that for a long time. If you guys want to ask me questions about that, we can absolutely talk about that. Um, an unprecedented spill. There had never been an oil spill like that ever in human history. Um, and a lot of what we thought as that was unfolding was wrong. And a lot of our responses to that problem were wrong. Um, it, it was it was a once the oil started flowing in the ocean, we were we were pretty messed up, and, and we didn't have a lot of good options at that point. Um, I cut the incident command a lot of slack because it was such a crazy thing. It was uh, uh, 1,500 um, uh, meters down into the uh, ocean. Excuse me, feet 1,500 feet into the ocean. It was. Uh, just crazy. It was all this weird stuff. And so a lot of the issues I saw going on there, I, um, I was deferential and, and I said, hey, you know, that, that's, these guys are trying to solve this problem. We've never had a problem like this. Many of those same exact problems we saw with the refugio spill. And now I'm actually thinking that that was not just a consequence of that, that unprecedented scale, the Deepwater Horizon, that there is something um, perhaps not optimal about how, how we're, as, at a federal level and an incident command level, how we're responding to these oil spills today. But we'll save that for a little bit. Um, some other spills you might have heard about. Um, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait and then when he, when he pulled out uh, during the first Gulf War, um, they, they torched a bunch of wells, they broke a bunch of wells, they set, set charges to a bunch of wells, and there was a massive release of oil, both on land and some of which spilled in, into the, the marine waters there. 
very poor estimates because it was, you know, it was a, a literal war zone. And the, so much smoke was created, our satellite imaging was screwed up. We couldn't, couldn't actually get accurate pictures of how big the pools were and this and that. Um, so, so the best estimate that we have for how much oil spilled there was six to eight million barrels. That's a two million barrel you know, error there. That, that's huge. But, but that data comes from a, a UN analysis post hoc. So we don't have any good data, but we know it was massive. Um, uh, the Exxon Valdez spill that happened in 1989, really important spill. That's what uh, led us to having, for example, double hulled tankers and a bunch of other uh, issues. The Exxon spill was about 15% of what the Deepwater Horizon released. Um, the Ixtoc one, which you may not have heard of, but during the midst of the Deepwater Horizon, this was talked about frequently. This is another Gulf of Mexico platform. This was in Mexico waters. This was owned by Pemex, the, the national oil company of, um, of Mexico at the time. This is 1979. Uh, tons of parallels to Deepwater Horizon. If you want to see how people responded to the Deepwater Horizon, almost word for word, we used sombrero instead of top hat, but, but all the terms and all the approaches that we tried to do to staunch the flow from this uh, uh, platform blowout, basically, that this oil well blowout uh, in the Deepwater Horizon, we actually did almost all of that in the Ixtoc 1. Um, we super lucked out in the Ixtoc 1. The way the winds and the currents went, it blew it all away from the Mexican shoreline, so very little was deposited there. Um, and it went across the, the Gulf of Mexico and landed on Texas shores, but we had months to be prepared for that oil landing. And so, um, so we also learned a lot from that oil spill. Talk more about in a second, probably the most important oil spill in US history, which is the 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. That was small though, that was about 2% of what the Deepwater Horizon was. Um, the Torrey Canyon, was our, which was our first big uh, super tanker that crashed over um, in, in Europe. Uh, and then the Lakeview Gusher that I already mentioned, which was again about twice the size, uh, released about twice as much oil as the Deepwater Horizon. So that's, that's a fair comparison from, from A to B to C. So um, what I want to next mention is the importance of the Santa Barbara oil spill. We cannot um, underestimate this. We live near Santa Barbara, and so sometimes we tend to think the stuff near us is important. This really, really was. This set the tone for, I would argue, everything that has come since with regards to oil spills and oil policy and all this and that. So let me remind you what happened with the 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill. Um, it, the, it, it probably flowed for more than a year, all told, although the main flow was only a little bit short of two weeks. We only know the oil was flowing, again, this is 1969. This is uh, before I was born. <laughs> uh, and it, uh, uh, we didn't have the technology we have now. We had, have, had very little of the technology we have now. We only know, we only first learned oil was flowing because some anonymous caller called the Santa Barbara News Press at night and said, hey, you might want to know there's this oil spill going on, click. So to this day, we still don't know who that anonymous tipster was. Somebody working on the rig clearly called, but we, we don't know who. Um, what essentially happened was we were, we were drilling an oil well, uh, as we had done in the past. Um, in this case, this was before we had the body of regulations that we currently have. And so these guys were drilling to the, what was, turns out to be actually easily crackable, sort of muddy type rock. And we're drilling into it, and the uh, company, this was uh, Unical at the time, 76, they said, hey, do you want us to, um, we're putting a straw, you can imagine a straw into the ground, do you want us to put an armor casing around that straw? And the agency at the time, which was the USGS, said, eh, yeah, put it a little bit, but you don't have to go all the way the full length. Well, it turns out what happened was the part that was armored, the, the strong straw near the surface, that didn't crack the problems happened below that armoring. So we know now that we should have armored the whole well bore, and that would have uh, very likely have um, helped the issue. Uh, then when we, were, when we were trying to stop the flow, they were basically jamming a bunch of cement and crud in it, and that further cracked the, uh, that, that, that added more pressure and it broke the, the tube, if you will, where the straw was. 
And so um, led to more of this stuff going. Um, now, this, in, as after this started happening, this set the tone. Everything that happened in Santa Barbara has been repeated to almost to the note. Deepwater Horizon um, uh, didn't quite happen exactly the same way in the Exxon spill just because it was hard to get to. But um, the refugio spill, all the same stuff comes up. Um, so firstly, what we see is um, a media circus fires up. Santa Barbara was where a lot of the media elite from LA would go to either, either live or would go to vacation. And so this suddenly hit home to a lot of the media. This was their backyard, their pretty place. And their pretty place was getting messed up and they didn't like it. Uh, it really helped crystallize this along with the rivers that were catching fire the Cuyahoga back in Ohio at almost the same exact time, people started saying, hey, there shouldn't be oil washing on the beach and there shouldn't be, water shouldn't be burning. And so this really helped crystallize and, and lead to the huge raft of environmental legislation that we had both at the California state level and at the federal level that came on in the early 70s, Clean Water Act, um, uh, National Environmental Policy Act, um, uh, Clean Air Act, all that stuff. We had a, the California Coastal Commission was created. All these, all these things created, um, and so the Santa Barbara oil spill had had a huge influence in galvanizing public opinion there, and especially the modern environmental movement. It also sets up this narrative that I would argue is not perhaps the most effective way to go forward, but it's either greedy oil people versus poor oiled birds or it's greedy oil people versus uh, NIMBY people that don't want it, not in my backyard, that, that uh, don't want to um, you know, have the problem here. And uh, both of those um, narratives, both those sides are not necessarily helpful for going forward and having effective change, I would suggest. Um, what we found is from the, from the Santa Barbara spill, we had increased toxicity and, and poisoning to a lot of different critters, but only a subset of what we originally, originally people said, if you go back and read the accounts, just like Deepwater Horizon, the world's gonna end, everything's gonna be dead, this is the worst thing ever. Um, what we saw was high mortality with seabirds. They were landing on the, on the surface of the ocean and getting oil on themselves, uh, which was bad for them. Marine mammals, so seals and sea lions and things that were also you know, right at the surface of the ocean and hauling out. So they were getting uh, hurt and killed. And then critters that could not move in the inner tidal, so barnacles, anemones, things like that, as the oil washed on, it basically smothered them. Um, and so that was clear. But everything else didn't happen. The world didn't end. People said, oh my God, the fishing is going to stop and this and that. And it didn't. And so what happened was um, some money was given to uh, the University of Southern California at the time um, when they they don't really have a marine ecology program anymore, but when they did, um, they gave it to those folks and said, how come the eco ecological toxicity, or what we call ecotoxicity from that oil spill, wasn't worse? Like, how come it only affected th these groups? And the answer was, again, the playbook that you see repeated over and over and over again. So what you see is they said, well, what's going on with eukaryotes? <clears throat> so eukaryotes are you and I. They're multicellular organisms, fish, birds, stuff like that. Um, these guys have just grown up and evolved in, in places that have a lot of oil, so we can, they can take it. So the, the critters that live in this area, they're, they're just used to a lot of oil. Because it's true, we have natural oil seeps in Santa Barbara. That's what the Chumash used to build their tomals. That's what um, we use for our, our old roads in Santa Barbara, all this kind of stuff. So there was, there's always been this, this background of some amount of leaking hydrocarbons forever. Uh, in, at least for the last, you know, hundreds of thousands of years in this part of the world. Um, and so, yeah, so big guys just sort of take it. Little guys like microbes, they actually have evolved with this, so they can actually eat the oil. So don't worry about it. So don't worry about the little microbes. They'll take care of it. Don't worry about the big things. They can handle it. Uh, one. Two, um, we, it, it was, the other thing about this oil spill, it was wave after wave after wave. A bunch of oil would come ashore. And people clean it up and we whew, okay, got that. And then a couple days later, blub, 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 more oil. And then blub, 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 more oil. And so, you know, why didn't we get um, even more impacts? Turns out we had a couple storms that blew through and mixed up the oil and broke it up. And so the assumption at the time was, hey, the oil didn't hit the beach, so we're golden, right? As if oil 
is fine for the ocean. <laughs> um, and then uh, next they say, oh, it's also fine because the heavy stuff um, sunk. Because a, a lot of this oil we have in Santa Barbara is not gasoline-like, it's more tar-like. And so therefore it sunk. It's, again, as if the bottom of the ocean doesn't care, right? So, so these, and, and it was very clear, the folks who wrote this report said, we know almost nothing because we had almost no baseline data, what the condition was before the oil spill happened. So they were doing the best they could. And, and so they said in the report, hey, this is what we think is going on, but we need better information to study this. Yeah. This was the scientific community writing these reports? It, uh, it, it, it was scientists, yeah, right. And so they really, I, I guess I, I'm confused, not confused, it just it seems unbelievable to me that that scientists would have thought oil didn't matter on the bottom of the ocean. Was that really 40 or 50 years ago what the thinking was? Yeah, yeah. So, so I think the thinking was, oh, down there it's not as bad. And it's, you know, da 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 da. And, and so we know uh, now that that is not true. There are, and the Deepwater Horizon shows this quite clearly. Um, but it's, these, these guys were very um, good scientists and they were sticking to what they could prove. And so they couldn't prove that uh, anything worse was happening. So to, again, to their credit, this was a several volume study. Uh, they collected a lot of data, but because they didn't have the before data, they couldn't say that the changes that they suspected might be happening were clearly due to the oil. So they said, these are the, these are the reasons why we think maybe it wasn't as bad as we otherwise would have guessed. But they all said, what we really need to do is set up long-term monitoring um, stuff. So the next time it happens, we can actually measure and quantify and say, ah, yeah, this was actually caused by the oil spill, this wasn't, kind of thing. Is the federal government, did they have the EPA at this point? No. No, so the EPA is created by Nixon uh, after the, six, in, in the, after yeah, after the spill. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, this is a different world, N not, not the world in which we live in. So a couple of the themes that we see that emerge from the 69 oil spill um, are just uh, powerlessness, right? That, were, that the oil coming out is immense. So let me remind you, we had, we had nothing like the technology we have now. It took um, President uh, Nixon retasking a U-2 spy plane to fly over the oil spill and take images because we didn't even know how big it was. We didn't even know, what, we, didn't, we didn't have the, the, the sensors and the tools to even you know, quantify it. So um, there's all kinds of problems. And what we're looking at here is we're looking straight down, an airplane picture straight down on platform A, the one that blew out. And you see all that sort of bubbling stuff. That's all oil that's, that's frothing up from the bottom of the ocean. And that dark sort of central smear is the oil um, on the surface of the ocean. The next theme is that, and again, on the picture on the left is that picture from the U-2 spy plane. Um, the... The, the other theme that shows up is that we can't do anything about it. So we're technologically impotent. So what do you see? You see people stacking up bales of hay on the beach and to soak up the oil, they throw the oil out and the oil acts something like a sponge. It sucks it up. Then you fork up all that oil and go throw it in the, uh, that oily hay and go throw that in a dumpster. Same stuff you'll see going on today, right? So, uh, so they would do all this massive cleanup, and then the next day more oil would wash in. And it was, it was, wait a second, the cleanup technology is not keeping pace with this incredible um, engineering prowess that we have to do, drill into the ocean and do stuff like that. The other thing that becomes clear is there's a huge ecological impact from this stuff. Um, so, for example, I, I was an undergrad at UC Santa Barbara, and one of my majors was birthed out of the 69 oil spill. It's called the Environmental Studies Department. And, um, and so, one, so if you were from Santa Barbara, the, a picture on the upper left is the worst thing in the world. It's, it's, it's um, a, uh, the kelp. There's a bunch of oily kelp there. So the ecosystem is messed up. That's, that's bad. We see all the wildlife we like to see, like the seabird right there on top of the, um, on top of the surfboard is all covered in oil. And then the surfboard is oiled. So your recreation, your environment, your, your aesthetics, everything is impacted by this oil spill. And so the picture on the right is uh, this veterinarian who grabs some volunteers and they basically said, hey, let's just try to wash this oil off with dishwashing, dishwashing detergent. That was the first use of this. And 
Turns out it, it, these guys were pretty much already dead because they, at that point, usually when we catch them, they've ingested so much oil and trying to preen themselves that they've pretty much poisoned themselves. But nevertheless, it was this first effort to, hey, let's do something, right? Let, let's get the citizens, the general public involved and give them a way to help. And so that was, uh, we've, had, we've made great strides since then. Um, also important, you hear statements from the oil companies that are uh, at least unfortunate, we can say. So this is the quote from the president of uh, Union Oil standing in the harbor of Santa Barbara talking to the media. And he says things like, uh, I don't call it what's, what's happening at, at the time of the oil washing on shore. And stuff. I don't call it a disaster because there's been no loss of human life. I'm amazed at the publicity for the loss of a few birds, right? So completely tone deaf to the public, to what the sentiment is. You see the same thing with Mr. Tony during the Deepwater Horizon and all that kind of stuff. All this stuff comes together to, as I said, create this very, very intense media firestorm. And um, all kinds of stuff happens. What do you see? You see the picture in the upper uh, middle. You see eventually President Nixon has to come out and walk on the beach and go, oh, yeah, there's oil here, right? See the same thing. President Obama eventually has to come to Louisiana and look at the sand and go, mm, get better do something, right? It creates this massive pressure on our political leaders to look like they're doing something and to show up. Um, all kinds of stuff were going on, um, including things like on um, the lower, lower left there, that's the uh, San Marcos, uh, that's the local high school, one of the local high schools in Santa Barbara. They were doing their regular you know, play. They threw the whole thing out and they wrote their own melodrama, which was, uh, you know, the poor, the poor woman needs to be saved by the you know, hero from the evil guy, but the evil guy is the oil industry and the poor um, woman is Barbara. So, so it, it works every, it's working everything into, into school kids' conception, it works into public, it, it is everywhere. So, so that's the narrative that we have. Okay, so that's, that's the backdrop. Let's talk about what happened with the refugio spill. Uh, what happened was, I, the first thing to say is, the situation that was created, this pipeline situation, was an attempt to be better. It was a direct response to folks in Santa Barbara saying, we don't want tankers going up and down the coast with crude oil. We think that's too big a risk. So rather, we'd like to have an, a pipeline. And a pipeline would be safer, right? It's easier to maintain. This guy trying to get in here. You're welcome to come in, man, if you want to, um, or not. Okay, so, uh, so we have this pipeline. And we, we have, uh, so the oil comes from the offshore production rigs, goes onto shore, stored, and then from there it just gets distributed out to different uh, areas, refineries in Kern County, etc. Um, the most recent reports that we have from a few weeks ago, the timeline, they, they put the spill at starting at about 11.30 in the morning, and it took at least a half hour before anybody did anything, which was a little bit crazy. Um, if, for no, if, if for no other reason, if you're a company making money on oil, you probably don't want your oil just spilling out on the ground. So there, there were several, um, this is still under investigation, there were several uh, failures of, of not just technology, but also the human side of the response chain. But be that as it may, oil broke. Now, this was primarily an, a land-based oil spill. So most of this oil spill, uh, spilled on the pipeline, which is to the landward side of the 101. It started pooling up. Um, and uh, the next thing that happens is people start smelling it at people that are at the beach and near the beach. And so then they call the fire department. The fire department comes up and the, fire, the, the um, Santa Barbara a County Fire Department starts seeing it and they're like, hey. And so, so it, it's unclear why the oil, well, well no one was notified um, uh, sooner. But in any event, that, that's, how we, that's how it came to public attention. So this oil basically pulls up on the landward side, pulls up, pulls up, pulls up, eventually it makes such a big pool that it fills, uh, that, it, that it reaches the culvert and that's designed to take rainwater and it floods in that culvert and spills down, and that's what you're seeing here on the uppermost picture, spills down onto the beach and then into the um, ocean. And so that's, that was the spill. Um, so much of this was 1969 played out Absolutely, again. So you see this, this 
famous picture on the lower right where some Santa Barbara undergrads going out and this was made it into a political cartoons and all kinds of stuff. And these guys are they're trying to do good, right? They're trying to help this little seabird, but they don't know what they're doing, right? They're, they're, they're doing their best, but, but they don't, they're not trained for this. They don't know how to properly handle stuff. And, and these guys are with their Walkmans and they're clearly walking on the beach and such. Citizens start going to Home Depot and just grabbing buckets and scooping up this oil. And so you see that on the left. So people are trying to do something and initially not sure what to do. And then we have folks like uh, Kamala Harris comes down, who is now our, our state attorney general, who's now running for um, Senate because I think she felt she had to be there. And she comes out clearly not prepared. So she spends, spends the entire news conference holding her hair because she can't even talk because her hair is flapping into her face. So again, clearly not perhaps prepared for the situation. And, and, and she says, you know, we will prosecute, we will prosecute, blah, 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 and then leaves, right? So shows up and leaves. Um, this, is, this is now that we've, we've staunched the flow, this is a, a day or so later, and we've started to pump it out and, uh, and take care of, and the, the, the pipe has been turned off and sucking up uh, oil. Um, I think it's important to say that uh, my lab group, my colleagues and I, we've been working on, for example, a lot of things, but one that pertains to today, the health of our sandy beaches. We've been doing this study for the last several years, looking at what makes a healthy beach, both in terms of humans and in terms of animals, in terms of all kinds of stuff. So we've been monitoring beaches up and down Southern California for the last four years. So this picture right here is not during the oil spill. This is the year before. So we were really, really well positioned. We normally, we normally monitor the beaches in June. The spill happened in mid-May. All of my students had just left school. We just, class had just ended. They were mostly going on a two-week vacation, going camping, going this and that. And they were going to uh, reconvene a couple weeks later. And I immediately called them all up and said, whoa, yeah, don't go camping. You got to come help me. And to their credit, mo almost everybody did. And, and that was the key reason. So suffice it to say, uh, we were getting ready for a long time. We have a lot of different experiences that have been helping our students get ready. So we get, we, the first phone call I got was on the 19th, um, the, the afternoon of the oil spill, and the media started saying, because I've worked, worked on oil spills before, and they said, hey, we want to come talk to you, and we want to know what you're doing about the oil spill. And I said, oil spill? There's an oil spill? OK, I guess we'll do something. And so, um, so the media were on it even before the regulators and, and folks were calling. So by the next morning, uh, within about 17, 18 hours, we were uh, on the beach monitoring what was happening. And so this is us at about 19 hours post, uh, post break. And so those are my students in the foreground. And then you see the, the folks in the, in the beekeeper suits. Those are folks looking for wounded uh, birds and such. This is El Capitan State Beach. This is a couple miles south. And at this point, um, we we're smelling strong oil, but no oil had been deposited. Later that afternoon, the oil starts coming ashore here. So we're able to get some of these measurements, just like you guys were asking about, we're able to have some of the before data so we can actually measure the impact of the oil spill in this case. Um, and the people kept coming and coming and talking and talking and talking. And so, um, so very little, yeah? What were you exactly, like what were the components of your measurements? Like what were you looking at now? What yeah, good question. So uh, for, so these. Maybe like a, like. Yeah. Right. Like what you were doing. Right. So, so we do a bunch of stuff, uh, but in this case, these guys are, are doing cores. So we take um, essentially the same volume of sand yeah. from different points up and down the beach. And we take that sand and we, we you see, they're, we're, we're very high tech. We're super rich. So, uh, so we use window screen from Home Depot. It's, it's a very expensive thing. You guys probably haven't heard of this. Uh, and we dump the sand in there and take that in the beach, shake it in the beach, and that the mesh size is just about right to let the sand go out, but most of the critters that are bigger than about a millimeter are retained. So the worms, the crabs, etc. And so then we count those guys. And most of those guys we count and then let go back in the sand. Things that are uh, called, and I'll talk about this in a second, but things that are sand crabs, which are the base of the food chain for just about everybody, the birds and fish, we actually um, not only count those guys, we measure how big they are, and we figure out if they're male or female, and we take a subset of those guys back to our lab to look at um, the parasite load that's inside them, and that all has to do with how many birds are on the beach and how healthy the beach is. So we do a bunch of things there. We do grain size, we do uh, microplastics, how, how much pollution is on the beach, all kinds of stuff. Um, 
but I, I can tell you guys more if you're interested in a sec. Um, so we're mostly looking at the things that people sometimes don't maybe care that much about, but the media is thinking about what's on Facebook and what's on Twitter and all that stuff is this, the warm fuzzies. So that's what everybody's worried about. And unfortunately, we're in the midst of this weird changing ocean condition, thanks to, most likely thanks to climate change. And so we've been seeing problems up and down our coast. So we've been seeing dead and dying marine mammals for you know, months and a year before this happened. And so we were finding dead guys on the beach. Now the dolphin on the left has oil on it, but the sea lion here on the right and a lot of the other marine mammals we found didn't appear to have any, at least gross oil on them. So they, they didn't have oil in their teeth. They hadn't looked like they'd been eating it or ingesting it. And these guys were almost all emaciated. And so these guys were not emaciated suddenly because oil hit them. They were emaciated because the food chain support for them has been nuked thanks to this changing ocean climate. So, so we have a confounding factor here where the ocean is changing into something new and teasing apart the oil part becomes hard. But nevertheless, the, the focus, everybody's attention, the reporters are always asking about what's it doing to the, what's it doing to the marine mammals? Again, the real impact we think was on the, the less, the less uh, media savvy critters. So things like these guys, these sand crabs. So what you see, sometimes you hear these guys called mole crabs. And so what you're seeing here on this rack line, this is a rack line, but instead of just a piece of algae that you'd normally see, this is a bunch of tar balls, right? So tar, 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 tar. Uh, here's a, the half of a, of a sand crab. Here's the sand crab parts. Here's a full sand crab. You never, ever, ever see adult sand crabs sitting on the beach. You might see their carapaces, their exoskeletons that they cast off to grow. Those you see fairly commonly, but you don't see actual guys. Actual guys that if a bird walks up to and eats, he can get meat and stuff like that from. We saw a lot of that, and we'd never, ever seen that before. And folks we talked to had never seen this before, short of you know, once, once every 20 years, you see it one or two here or there, but you never see this. So this was pretty clear evidence to us that the oil was killing these guys. These guys, well, if you have a look at this, the oil is moving, the oil floats, right? So the oil is moving up and down the beach. So when the tide goes up, the oil goes up. When the tide goes down, the oil goes down. These guys track with the tide. So these guys have these cool little things right here. Their, their antennae right here are basically feeding appendages. They're thinking of big feather boas. And so when the water comes in, they put, their, they put their butt in the sand and they pop their head up into the tumbling surf and they kick in particles of little, little plankton and stuff into their mouths and that's how they feed. So these guys are the worst hit by this exact type of oil spill because they are, they are moving up and down and they're being uh, uh, nuked by this, <laughs> this stuff. The other big thing we think that was most likely heavily hit were the grunion. These are an important fish, used to be an incredibly important fish, and their numbers have been declining over the last decade or so um, for a variety of reasons. Um, these guys, again, they live out in the ocean. They come onto the beach to lay their eggs in the wet sand. Again, very close to the tide line. And these eggs, which you see right here, this is, this is a mesh bag with some, some eggs we got near Marina Park in Ventura. Um, those eggs are all being exposed to this oil, right? So these eggs lay on the beach for about several weeks, about 30 days, while they develop into little baby fish. And then when the, the next big high tide comes out, they, they crack open, they hatch open, they go out in the ocean. So they're sitting here in this soup of, of oil. And this is a picture of a grunion on the upper right that we took at night, so it's kind of blurry. But this is, you know, right after the spill, they're, they're sitting there spawning in the midst of this stuff. So without showing you guys a bunch of crazy scientific data, um, we started doing experiments. So it looked like there was problems, right? It looked like from the data that we had, that the field data that, hey, these sand crabs and these, these guys in the intertidal were getting nuked, but we couldn't prove it was directly because of the oil at that point, because we'd only had observational data. So we did these experiments where we set up a bunch of different chambers, and this, this is uh, uh, seawater, and there's little sand crabs in there, or sand crab eggs, one or the other, depending on which experiment we're talking about. And we put in different concentrations of oil in environmentally relevant concentrations that, that they were exposed to out there. This is in my old lab. 
And this is what it looks like. So some had a lot of oil and we have air stones. So they have enough uh, air and all that kind of good stuff. And um, long story short, surprise, surprise, the oil is not good for these guys. So the oil nukes these guys. So on the right, you see these little babies. These are eggs now, little uh, eggs developing and they're developing normally. So they have eye spots and so they're, they're starting to turn into little baby fish. That's awesome. On the left, you see guys that were exposed to tar. And what you see, you don't see any eye spots. You see they look sort of more funkily shaped. They're not as, not as even. And these guys were, if not outright killed, radically delayed in their development and or experiencing defects as the embryos were growing. So we know that this oil um, had negative impacts on the ecology of our beaches. The other, uh, the next thing was, uh, is this okay? Am I going, am I going too fast? Yeah. Just a question. Yeah. Are, are you able to determine whether it's a, 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 to a chemical toxicity or oxygen deprivation or what is the mechanism? It, it, uh, good question. It's most likely the, the, the tar because they were hypersaturated with, with oxygen. So it was, not, it was not a lack of oxygen, although there could have been some other secondary effects and not direct oil toxicity. But it's pretty clear the presence of oil is associated with this bad behavior or, or, or bad development. Um, good question. So number next is, so uh, everything happens. And then uh, the first two days after the oil spill were very calm. So we were able to do a lot of booming, surround the oil slicks, suck up the surface of the, uh, the oil off the surface of the ocean and, and take care of that. And got a lot of the oil recovered that way. Comparatively speaking, so that was good. After the second day, it started getting more stormy and windy. And you can only boom when the ocean is very smooth and, and like, a, like a pancake. So then th they said, you know, I, we'll talk about the instant command in a second, but they said, ah, you know, it's all good. Oil's gone, you know, out to sea, don't worry about it. Starting a few days after that, we started seeing this oil wash up in Manhattan Beach and then in other parts of LA. And then, and there was some weird stuff started happening because um, 20,000 gallons was the initial quote as to how much oil got to the um, beach and ocean. That's about, depending on what size, you know, gasoline tanker, that's, you know, four or five of those kind of tankers. So that's a lot of oil, but it's not the end of the world. It's not destroy everything under the planet, you know. Um, but just in Manhattan Beach alone, they pulled off four dump trucks full of Tar, mostly tar, not tar and sand, it was mostly tar. And so the numbers didn't seem to quite be adding up. And, and this is the kind of deposition we're seeing. This particular picture is from, I took from uh, uh, near the harbor in Ventura, but unusual amounts of deposition. It is true that in some places like Santa Barbara, sometimes in Ventura we get, because of these natural oil seeps, we would occasionally get some tar balls, but nothing like this. Some of these things were inches thick of tar balls, right? This is very unusual. So we took our samples, we gave our samples to the, to the state and other folks giving samples to the state. They said, oh, we'll know in a couple, we're going to go fingerprint it, chemically fingerprint the oil to see if it matched the oil from the, the site or if it was some other thing. Um, it took over six weeks to get that data back for reasons that aren't clear because we can take one of those pieces of oil and put it in one of our machines and get the answer in about, mm, you know, 10 minutes. So, uh, so I, under, I understand there's a whole thing with chain of command and you want to be careful and you want to double check, but, but so that, that's on the order of days. That's not on the order of weeks and weeks and weeks to just know if yes or no, this oil is indeed um, uh, fr from the oil spill. And it most clearly was. We were being very cautious at the time saying, we're waiting to see, but it's highly unusual to say the least. Um, and so uh, that, combined with the fact that incident command, which, is, which are the folks in charge of this, were not um, releasing information very quickly. So they would release maps like this. You guys, it's probably hard to see, but this is a map of the coastline and the color is showing the degree, how much oil is deposited. So hotter the color, the more oil. And what you see is some places are red and then some places are not so bad. And then there's some places that are not so bad right next to a place that's really bad. And so it's this very patchy plop, 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 plop oil. But these guys are required legally to do daily surveys. You'd get a map, mm, you know, four weeks later, five weeks later. So, so the, the, the um, clarity with which information was coming out was non-existent, I would argue. So as this is happening, yeah. 
who makes up incident command? I don't mean sure. people's names, but sure, sure, sure. So incident command. So uh, so this is the the current system that we have is um, a product of what happened with the Exxon spill. So we created a thing called Open 90, Ocean Pollution Act of 1990, in response to that. With that oil spill, we actually changed policy. With the Deepwater Horizon, basically nothing has happened, which is massively irresponsible in my opinion. But we, so we, we started setting up this different way of doing stuff, set up this thing called NERDA, a Natural Resource Damage Assessment Protocol, and that was kind of going forward. And then we had 9-11, so 9-11 created the Department of Homeland Security, and they set up the, so the current uh, National Incident Command Structure. So that's, there's a whole playbook, and it depends on what we're talking about. If it's a nuclear accident, if it's a, if it's a virus outbreak or whatever. In the case of oil spills in the ocean, the Coast Guard is the entity in charge. And it sets up a, what's supposed to happen is a paramilitary organization, just like with a wildfire, where there's, there's a head, and then all the different agencies that have something to do with wildlife or whatever are part or you know, are underlings in that command structure. So um, ev just about everybody is supposed to be involved. Coast Guard is the entity in charge. Um, turns out, uh, n not to jump to the end here, but turns out what um, one of the problems was when the 1969 oil spill happened, Santa Barbara County said that's the last time that happens here. So Santa Barbara has the strictest uh, drilling regulations and protocols of anywhere else in the country. And that probably means the, the world. And so Santa Barbara, the, the county government, the county office in Santa Barbara that regulates oil and gas drilling, very, very powerful, very, very clear. They, have, they had an understanding, they thought that when these things happen, we're in charge. When there's an oil spill, the county's in charge and then the feds or, or, or state or whoever else is, is you know, working with us, these aren't exclusive things, but, but they would take the lead. That wasn't tested until this. This was the first test of that. And suffice it to say, the feds said, we're in charge. And the county of Santa Barbara sort of said, no, we're in charge. And um, it had the effect of setting up a, a sort of two kind of parallel incident command structures. So my, my uh, university has the first ever MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, with NOAA to work on drones with their um, Center for Unmet Excellence. So my lab, we do a lot with um, underwater robots and aerial robots. These are a few of our things, some of which we've built, some of which are, we've customized, other which, others of which are just regular commercial products. In this case, we're using these this past summer in the Cook Islands to help this small Pacific Island nation map their resources and do stuff. So we have the capability to follow oil and all that kind of stuff. Our partners at NOAA call us up as the oil spill is happening saying, hey, can you guys come up and fly this spill for us with your, with your robots as long as you give us a copy of the data because we're having problems getting images. And we said, sure, no problem. Uh, we weren't allowed to fly because another agency basically said, no, you can't fly. So. Now, hindsight's, fit, hindsight's perfect, right? But, but I would argue if we had a better sense of what that oil slick was doing, we would have been, had much greater confidence that those oil dollops we saw were actually indeed coming from um, our oil spill. Um, it, took, it took this fingerprinting weeks and weeks and weeks, a, a mathematical model or UCSB it was using some models and finally sort of showed the same thing, but it took a lot of time. So we had the ability to respond to this and we weren't allowed to. So that's another problem. Um, and this is the kind of stuff we can do when we, we have a chance. We weren't allowed to do that. Okay, so what do we do? Yeah. I chose not to mention the name of the agency. Was that deliberate? The agency that said you can't It was the Air National Guard because they were, it, they were the air boss. They were in charge of the airspace. So they locked down the airspace, which was appropriate. They, they want to have you know, their helicopter and stuff flying. They don't want to have any, you know, yahoos flying around. But it seems to me when, when, we're, when we're asked, um, it kind of seems... So, so, so it was one of these FUBAR situations, right? It wasn't as if someone didn't want us to help, but the overlapping bureaucracy is, yeah, it, that's the problem. You mentioned a lot about the hold up and getting the clearance. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Now, is that like feds that were holding things 
up or was that a state? Uh, so uh, we gave all our samples to the state and, and those folks. Um, so it, it was the incident command was technically handling it all. So ultimately they sent some samples to Woods Hole, some samples to UCSB, and literally that's all that we know. Was it the command center then? That yes, was yes, yes, yes. So, but the actual process has been very opaque. So. So again, I don't think it's that someone was intentionally causing a problem or trying to delay, but it was, it's this sort of overlapping, you gotta double check and, and all this and that. Um, so all this necessitates us since we can't, we're monitoring the beaches, but yet we don't, we're not, they're not giving us any data. And I can tell you guys other stories too, if, if you want. I'll, I'll, I can tell you stories for hours about the crazy things that we're having. But, um, but suffice to say, we just said, okay, forget it. We're gonna do it ourselves. So for the beaches that we started visiting, we, well, in the past, we'd not added a, a tarring, a tar ball metric because we hadn't needed it. Now we suddenly need a tar ball measurement. So we started measuring that at all the beaches and we came up with our own measure of how, how tarred beaches were. And that included you know, visual looking as well as collecting samples in the field and weighing them from defined areas. So we had a relative scale. And so we could figure out our own map on the bottom of areas that were heavily hit by tar balls, for example, and areas that weren't hit by tar balls. So one of the neat things that this spill allowed us to do, though, is test some things that we normally can't. So this is uh, some of our data from the um, Deepwater Horizon. And uh, the only reason I'm showing this is because what you see is here's, the, here's where the wellhead was. There's a lot of impact here. And then as we go far away, it sort of tapers off less and less and less and less and less and less. That's typically how oil spills happen. You have the epicenter. And that's where the most stuff happens. And as we go farther away, it's a little bit less, a little bit less, a little bit less. That's not what we had here. We had this really, and so if you want to test what's the effect of the oil, there's other things that change, right? That's near the mouth of the Mississippi. So as we go farther away, we're also less influenced by the Mississippi River. And there's all these other variables. But with this oil spill, we actually had the unique ability to look at the effect of oiling independent of, um, because, because that oiling was so episodic, as to what was going on. So again, our group really takes an interdisciplinary approach. So we don't just look at the biology, we look at the human side of stuff and all this and that. And so in this case, these are some of my students out sampling um, in Santa Barbara, and then this lady is taking one of our surveys. So we surveyed 33 different beaches up and down the coast, uh, uh, public opinion and, and, and people's behaviors at 33 different beaches, and we correlated that to how, uh, what, the, what the tar score was, what the oil exposure was. And so we, uh, oh, yeah. Could that be, ironically, Platform A in there? Oh, good question. No, yeah, good. Uh, Platform A is down by Summerlin. This was up farther north. But yeah, oh, but, but, okay. but good, good question. I like it. <laughs> okay. um, the other thing to say before I show you those data um, is uh, an observation we've had. So we've also been doing, we, do, we poll about 1,000 to 1,500 people every year, every fall about attitudes towards coastal things and stuff in Santa Barbara, Ventura, and Los Angeles counties. We've been doing it for about a decade. We've written some scientific papers. In fact, I was supposed to write another scientific paper about that data this past summer until the oil spill happened, and then I got distracted by the oil spill. Um, but for example, this is when you ask people, hey, is seafood safe to eat? And we ask if people think it's seafood safe to eat from a bunch of different places around the world. And this is the effect of the Deepwater Horizon spill. So what you see is, um, you know, less than 20% of the people on average, this is the average and then a measure of error here, but this is an average of less than one fifth of the people think that seafood from the Gulf of Mexico is safe to eat right after the, right after the Deepwater Horizon happens. And it takes a long time. It takes you know, about five years for it to get a bit better. It's still really low compared to most places in the world, but there's this long window of people's perception of impact. So we did this, Excuse me, we did the same thing asking about, or do people think that seafood from California is safe to eat? We normally just ask about California. So in 2012, more than half people think seafood is safe to eat here. Uh, you know, 2013, you know, more, you know, da-da-da, like that. And then um, this is uh, what happened when you ask about the regular seafood, California-wide, and then, then we started asking, what about Santa Barbara specific? So there's a definite perception that Santa Barbara seafood is bad. 
right? So that's a clear economic impact on our, our fishing community. Regardless as to whether it is or isn't safe to eat, that means people are going to be averse to, to buying and eating seafood from the region, right? So that's a clear economic impact. But it turns out what we found with this oil spill, unlike the Deepwater Horizon, this effect seems to be ephemeral. So this was in, what was this? This was in uh, May, June. This was in September, October. And so by just a few months later, there still is a, an effect. It's significant, it's significant. So there still is a fact that people think that Santa Barbara seafood is less safe than California overall, but it's, it's getting diminishing. And we think when we repeat this stuff, this coming fall, it'll be totally uh, non-significant. Non so, so small effect there. This is what we found when we asked, um, do people go to the beach? Or, or, or excuse me, how far do they drive to get to the beach on these 33 different beaches? And so just to explain this, this is how much tarring there was. So this is no tar at all, a little bit of tar, a little bit more, up to the most heavily tarred beaches. Those are our categories. And on this axis, this is asking people, how far did you drive today to get, or bike, or whatever. How far did you travel to get to the beach today? And so long story short, there's no significant difference. People at the most heavily tarred beaches uh, drove no, statistically not any farther than folks that were at the clean beaches. Again, this is from LA, all the, or actually Orange County, all the way up to Santa Barbara. So this is covering a wide range of, of areas and a wide range of uh, tarring. But then, if you ask them how much money they either spent in the last week at the beach or if they just got to the beach they were planning on spending in the coming week, this is what you find. What you find is um, there's a huge effect on expenditures, self-reported expenditures that people are going to, you know, hotels, food, whatever. And so uh, the beaches that are lightly tarred are getting a lot of uh, spending. The heavily tarred beaches, number six, getting very little. So people are probably driving to the beach, checking it out, maybe, maybe paying for parking or something like that, and then going home. Whereas the other beaches, they're coming, paying for parking, and then they're going to a restaurant, then they're checking a hotel, they're camping, they're doing whatever. So a clear economic impact from the beach, but it turns out, long story short, that's ephemeral. So by the time we ask that again in September, that difference has gone away. So the, the sociological effect, the economic effect is real, but it, it is only lasted for you know, a few months or so. Yeah? Is there any um, data to substantiate the people's impressions? It, or is, um, when an oil spill happens, is there like residual um, yes. that, that people learn about, and that's why they, they still think that the seafood is unhealthy? Yes, like yes. I think in my own opinion, like, yeah, gold shrimp. I'm like, I'm still right. like on the fence. Right, 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 right. Is, is it Absolutely. So, so yeah. So there's a there's a clear lingering effect, and um, we see this also with Fukushima. We ask people about, about say seafood from Japan, um, and and uh, that really does persist. We we have this data. I haven't. I don't have it here today, but I'm not showing you today. But we also say, have you changed? We ask people if you've changed your opinion about offshore oil drilling, for example, or nuclear power because of the songs the San Onofre uh, station problem. And, and it, there's a clear effect, there's a clear impact. Um, uh, with most things, most significant things, so things at the scale of Deepwater Horizon, at the scale of Fukushima, that seems to be persistent, or at least persistent for many, many years. With this small oil spill, it seemed to be much more ephemeral. So it, it's, it appears to be, to primarily relate to how much media coverage the issue gets. But yeah, where else would the average person? Right, absolutely. So we're in the we're we're in the middle of trying to analyze this better with a, a study looking at Twitter posts and Twitter postings and people's it's called sentiment analysis. So when they talk about the beach, do they are you are they using positive words? Are they using negative words? And um, that's that's in progress. I don't I can't share it with you, but but the strong impression is that that will track with with these other metrics. What's the realistic? Um, now, now it's you would be hard pressed to see the the effect. Now, where you're going to see the effect of anything would be on in the genetics of these fish. So things like PAHs, metals, a lot of the markers that we see, um, a lot of those have have sort of been sort of cleaned out or died back to background levels. But you can see some changed gene expression, 
in some, in some critters, um, definitely in the, in the case of Deepwater Horizon, this spill was relatively small. So this, there's not much going on there. The biggest impact would probably be on the sand crab populations and, and grunion populations. You had mentioned that uh, the amount of oil recovered as, as logs was, dis was larger. larger than you would expect mm -hmm. for a spill that size. Did you work backwards to see whether you could recreate an est a more realistic estimate of what the amount of oil that actually got? Not yet. We, we would like to, but we, just haven't had, we haven't had time yet. But yeah, yeah. And so what you find is, you guys probably didn't see any news stories, right? right? But the number, the amount of oil that's gotten into the, into the ocean is, has been revised upwards now. But those, those are usually very, you know, like Friday afternoon posts and things like that. So, um, I mean, part of it is, is not nefarious or anything. It's just people are running around with their heads cut off and they're like, I don't know, it's about 20,000 gallons. And everybody quotes 20,000 gallons, 20,000 gallons. And, and it takes a long, usually a long time for people to re-look at that. Are there any scientists doing, and this would be really difficult, yeah. but doing um, research on the effect on the food chain? Uh, yes, we're, we're trying to. Um, there are some studies funded by NERDA, the Natural Resources Damage Assessment Process, so that's absolutely happening. The issue with that, though, as with the Deepwater Horizon, and this is, this is maybe more for a conversation for us to have, but um, um, let me sit, ba sit back and explain a little bit more about the incident command structure. How it works is, uh, the current thing is, you, the polluter, cause the problem, you, the polluter, have to fix it. Before Exxon, it was we spilled some oil and then we hired a bunch of eco economics experts and this and that and they kind of look at it and they go, mm, that, cost, that was probably about $5 million worth of damage. And the government would say, give us $5 million and then they would fix it. That's not the approach that we take now. How we, the general approach we take now is, hey, your oil thing is spilling or your stuff is spewing, you polluter, you clean it up. I don't care how much it costs, you clean it up, right? And you return the, the resource to the state it was before. So what that means is BP was sealing the, the well, right? Plains All-American was cleaning up the beaches. And I, I think it, that uh, is difficult from the outside. People look at it and go, wait a second, why, why is BP saying what's going on, right? The process that's supposed to happen is the, the incident command, is, and, and they are part of the incident command structure, the polluter. Um, the government is supposed to be looking over those guys' shoulders and saying, uh, you know, they're cleaning up, they're going, yeah, 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 yeah. And then when they see something wrong, they go, hey, no, 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 dude, you need to do that, right? They're supposed to be the check and making sure they're doing it right. Um, there's some, it, it, that doesn't work perfectly well. I'll just say it that way. So a lot of the data that we needed to prove what we think was, was happening with the deep water horizon um, we needed to have permission to go into the closed area to collect, um, for example, look at the effect of the dispersants and stuff. Weren't given that. Because BP would say, it's too dangerous. Too dangerous for you scientists guys. We have all these cleanup operations and this and that, which I, I can sympathize with. But the answer should be, in my opinion, as the science guy, so I'm obviously biased here, but the, the, the answer should be, you can't come in today. We're going to make a, a four-hour time slot for you two days from now. That's not what happens. What happens is, no, 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 we'll get back to you. 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 So with the case of the refugio spill, I don't know how many times we put in requests to, to actually, um, we, we were trying to swim our underwater robots to look and see if there's any subsurface deposition. No, one of my students, one of my former students is a, is a game warden. He was the, one of the guys patrolling the outer, the outer perimeter. And so we got, we got permission to go on their boat and be on their boat and look around. And then at the last minute, uh, their command structure said, no, 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 it's, you know, you guys can't be on the, the enforcement boat. And, and so, um, so, you know, it was every couple days we'd call up and they, they, they'd lost our application. So we'd submit another application. And after like the eighth or ninth time, we sort of stopped sending in applications. And um, again, I don't think it's a direct nefarious thing. It is the bureaucracy working its working its way through the system. And so um, what, it, what, it, what it amounts to is independent oversight, is independent data collection to look at, to quantify the impact does not happen. And so for example, we have the Deepwater Horizon happen, and then I say, oh man, 
you guys, so the, the real impact of the Deepwater Horizon was the midwater and the bottom of the ocean. That's what, that's what bore the brunt of the impact. So when I look at that and I go, oh, you guys killed a bazillion million jellyfish, right? Uh, the folks, you know, the lawyers from BP, you know, they're, they're smart folks. They're, they're working for their client. They said, oh, that's, that's nice. Thanks for telling us that a bunch of those guys. How do you know that? Like, well, you know, there's oil. Oh, I'm sorry. Were you measuring the jellyfish beforehand? Do you know the jellyfish the concentration the year before? Like, well, no, I don't. Oh, you don't have that? Mm, sorry. Yeah. No, you, you can't prove that. And, you know, in a court of law, they're correct. I can't, I can't prove it. So what you'll see in a lot of these areas is a lack of funding for long-term monitoring, right? Because if you're not looking for an impact, when it happens, you can't, it's much harder to prove it, right? And we have to be much more creative about how we go about proving it. The other thing that, that uh, another interesting aspect of this, this is a couple friends of mine from college. One guy works for industry now, one guy's a professor. And we were having lunch in the now closed Joe's Crab Shack. And um, I, I, I'm a loud guy, but I was actually not being particularly loud. We we're, were just talking. Our families are there. You can't see our kids are off to the right side. Um, and this gentleman comes over and heard me. Uh, and this was just after, this was about a month after the oil spill. And I was telling my friends, marine biology colleagues, about what we were seeing and what was happening. And this guy walks over and says, can you please keep your mouth closed? Very angry. Can you please keep your mouth closed? And he said, uh, this is my job that you're talking about. My job's on the line. And stop talking about this. And then turned around in a huff and just bolted, left the restaurant. So clearly, you know, understandably, these are sensitive issues. But the problem is the information isn't getting out. So there's all this weird partial misunderstanding. And that stems from, I would suggest, this Gordian knot that's the incident command. So um, for example, we, I would call up daily and report all these dead seabirds that we were seeing, right? Okay, you, know, you guys should send the bird team to take this carcass to go test it and da 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 da. Sure, no problem, sure, no problem, sure, no problem. Then I'd have the public come up to me and say, wow, what happened, what happened with all that, those, the goon squads yesterday that shut down the beach? Shut down the beach? They can't legally shut down the beach. Like, no, no, nobody shut down the beach. Yeah, they did. And, you know, it's sort of these, these weird rumors, some of which was absolutely true, some of which wasn't. I am calling, and so we're out there, right? We're the ones with that we have these vests on for safety, so we look like we're some kind of government representatives. Or, so people are talking to us, and I'm trying to be the voice of reason and fairness and communicate facts. Can't get any facts out of incident command. So I call up and say, can you guys just give me an update? Were, were you guys here on this beach yesterday? Mm, yeah, I can't tell you. And it's like, wait a second. You can't tell me? I'm the guy that's feeding you all this. I can't tell you. can't tell you. So... The other, um, the other aspect of this, of this incident command structure that's, that's a problem is the fact that they would put out websites that you'd click on a link and it would be 404 website can't be found. So if you're going to not communicate to the public clearly, how can you possibly expect people to trust you, right? And, and that, that you're doing the, the work of the public. The other thing was how variable this was. So this tarring was extremely variable. So someplace we go out like this that had a lot of tar, and the guys on the beach would come up to me and go, what's up with this, man? Why, why are you, aren't you guys on the news more saying how horrible this is? The world's ending. And you would go down literally maybe a quarter mile down the beach, and it would be virtually clean, right? And you'd have a bunch of other guys sitting there going, this is a big conspiracy, man. They keep talking about this oil spill in the news, and this is a joke, man. There's no oil here. So it was, because it was so patchy, it was very, very easy to get a misimpression of the actual story. And because people weren't going like us up and down the coast every day and checking stuff out, it is completely understandable that people were taking uh, partial impressions away. And I would argue that's the responsibility of our political leaders and our, and our government to step in there and provide a clear voice. And, and an objective voice and, and you know, can't, the other part of this is you can't tell everything because this NERDA process, that they're gathering data and, and to answer your question, they're looking at ecological impacts. They're gathering that because they're getting ready to sue Plains All-American, right? They're gonna say, hey, you, you're gonna pay these amount of Clean Water Act damages or whatever the case is. So they can't necessarily give all of their data out, right? Because they wanna keep it close to the chest. So it's this whole mix of 
of the, the courts are in charge and the lawyers are in charge and the bureaucracy stuffs it up. So we're left as the people and as the people that spend our time at the beach and, and, and enjoy our coastline and our resources, we don't know what to do, right? And so we're left with press releases from folks with vested interests and all this and that. And uh, so it's a, it's a squiggly place that we're in here. So one of the things we did was we created, we have this tool on our campus called CI Keys. So I created this little website called the Oil Spill um, History and Ecotoxicology, primarily for reporters, because so many reporters would be calling us up every day asking for stuff, and they would be getting, and they were, you know, Joe Blow reporter. They weren't the environment reporter or the oil beat reporter. And so they were just getting basic facts and stuff wrong. So I started putting up some of our papers and some presentations just so that I said, you know, hey, go look at this. You can download this figure or you could do that. Primarily as a way to reach out to the journalists so they would, they would be reporting accurate information because they have, you know, one hour before deadline kind of thing, right? And this turned out to be, have been a very useful website. So we've, we've all kinds of people come and visit it now. And uh, we don't post as frequently as we used to in the midst of the spill, but we do, we, we're constantly putting up information up there. Um, and, uh, and so if you guys are curious, you can get to that. The website is oil.piratelab, which is my lab, .org. And so that, that has, and all the old stuff's there. You guys can go back and look at some of our field, field stuff. And there's a ton of um, links to uh, news stories and, and things of that nature there. And then the last thing, just to finish up, to say that um, one thing we've been doing is this was all student-based, or, or primarily student-based, my undergraduate students. These weren't PhD students, they're not master's students, they're my undergrads, and they get fantastic training. Um, and uh, so, for example, some of, the, some of the techniques we changed and evolved and, and adapted to respond to the oil spill, these are some of my students teaching high school kids in the Cook Islands how to do some of these surveys and, and look for impacts on their beach. So um, we really do try to apply these lessons uh, and, and pull that into not just our research and our communication, but also to our training of the next generation of scientists. So to, to sum up, I, I've gone way too long, I apologize. Great questions, you guys, and I'm, I'll hang out as long as you want to answer questions. But, but the, the takeaway from Refugio, what we know so far, the sandy beach was really the, the community that was most impacted. We didn't see much subsurface deposition. Um, it really was a floating oil, and it really was tar balling really hurt the sand dwelling critters didn't so much we don't think it, i mean it few, killed a few here and there but but big picture didn't nuke the marine mammals per se but we did see these significant socioeconomic impacts although those do seem to have been ephemeral and relatively fleeting another big story is this crazy gordian knot that's the incident command that um, appears to be an emergent property of this system we have it was not confined to the Deepwater Horizon, it appears to be what we've inherited, and we need to fix that. We need to make it better. And so far, there's been zero response to do this from the Deepwater Horizon incident, and this is a much smaller in scale incident, but, but we're not seeing the response I would hopefully like to see from our elected representatives to deal with this. Not to say that oil companies are the most evil thing on the planet, but to rather, to rather deal with this as adults and, and make sure we don't, we learn from our mistakes, right? No harm, no foul here, but let's not repeat this problem again. And I see very little uh, movement towards that, unfortunately. It happened with Hurricane Katrina. That's right. Nothing's changed. Yep. No. Yeah, and, and I take students, I have a class we go every year uh, to Louisiana. We work on wetland restoration, and we used to rebuild homes. Now we spend half our time doing wetland restoration, the other half we install food gardens in, in impoverished neighborhoods that don't have access to clean food. And we're really, um, intermeshed in the recovery process there and I could talk to you for hours about that recovery process but but yes the 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 lack of of uh, let's get in and get it done at our uh, highest government level levels is is unfortunate is, is disappointing and then um, and so then again this notion that there are ecological impacts but also this this the this, this social impact, the perceptions of impact, and how that influences people's spending and stuff. That's an important part of this story. And then lastly, I would argue that our, our students are really well prepared because we train them in an interdisciplinary fashion to understand what happens during, for example, oil spills, or for that matter, Hurricane Katrina, and to respond. And, and we're very lucky that our almost all of our we have almost 100% employment. Uh, of our of my undergrads getting or graduate school coming out from our department, which is not not the norm from a lot of uh, 
sort of biological, ecological departments. So, so that's us. That's, that's all I have. I, I could go on for hours, but I'll be quiet. So thanks, you guys. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Are we talking about senators, Congress? What level would you even consider? Yeah. Well, so so I think um, uh, all. I would say all. So I would say um, when uh, you know, so we're going to ele an electoral season now. I would say it's totally fair game to ask um, what's happening with the Porter Ranch situation. What's happening with the Refugio situation? And, and how do you see stuff as being different? The first thing you'll hear is you'll hear folks say, oh my God, we gotta have a law to have a new valve or something, which, you know, that, that's, that's they have okay. They already, they just Right, yeah. but the bigger problem, I think, is this, is this institutional, you know, systems level approach.